your Bibles this morning, if you will open them to Revelation chapter 19. We are getting close to the end of Revelation. Still have a little way to go, but I tell you what, I hope you will uh, plan to be here over the next several weeks as we wrap up Revelation because it is some good material that will encourage your heart. The Bible gives us a promise when we read Revelation that it will be a blessing to us. And I hope that you were able to say that. Uh, it has certainly been a blessing to me over this last uh, little bit over a year as we journeyed through the book of Revelation chapter by chapter. Uh, I've told you before, by no means has our study been exhausted. And so I hope that you will continue to read this wonderful book, continue to study and grow. Um, if I had taken the time to try to explain everything in detail and answer every question, uh, we would be in Revelation for the next decade, I think. So I've tried to just give you a skim over to give you a better handle on this wonderful book. And that has been my goal. The title of today's message is The King is Coming. It's one of my favorite things to say. Jesus is coming. And I hope that those are encouraging words to you. They certainly are to me. What a night last night was. How many of you were watching the game last night? Must have been a lot of you because there's a lot of orange in this room. I was at the Seymour football field watching some of our kids play. And uh, that's always fun in and of itself. Last night we were watching the kids play. And we were also watching the Tennessee game at the same time. I thought about those poor kids out on the field when we won. Because all this cheering started and they were kind of like, what? <laughs> what is going on? I was sitting at that time. I started out sitting with the Whites uh, and it was, we watched Cade play. And then I went and visited with the Delosiers. They were up in the stands. We were watching Fox play. And I was sitting between Kim and Don. And so we were watching the game on Duke's phone, which uh, I think he had his phone on CBS Sports. But whatever it was, was a little bit, just this much delayed from whoever was down the way in the bleachers. And we were in that nail body moment, you know, few seconds, it just, it was down. There was a Hail Mary or something had to happen. And, and uh, we, I was sitting there trying to watch what was going on on Duke's phone. And we were waiting for him to kick the field goal. And all of a sudden, I was still waiting. And all of this cheering broke down down there. And I was trying to figure out what. It took me a minute. Donna starts beating her pastor on the shoulder like this. (laughs) 
It was an exciting moment, y'all. <laughs> and then it hit my brain what had happened. And then I realized that we had made the field goal and we won the game. And then, of course, you saw the images coming through on what was taking place at Neyland Stadium and, and all. And I started seeing friends' videos of, of that moment. I know Brother Billy posted a video of what was going on in the Maples house at that moment. It was pandemonium, Brother Billy. You know, I was, it was so much fun to watch all that excitement. It truly was. And uh, listen, it's great to have sports teams and all, and we pull for them. And it is a joyful experience when we win. I was so proud of our balls. I was so proud of our coach. It's been a long time coming and a lot of hard work. I don't know if my prayer made any difference, but it probably didn't because I know Alabama people were praying too. But I thought I would argue a little harder. <laughs> and so I said, Lord, I'm praying for favor on this team. That other team has won quite enough. <laughs> and I don't know if he honored that for my prayer or if it was just their time to win. But I was so proud of them. But what a time of excitement. And you know, I thought that if we could just capture that excitement when we think of this truth, the Lord is coming soon. Amen. Dear Christian, that should be the type of excitement that wells up in our heart when we begin to realize how close we are to his coming. We might be able to hear that trumpet blast soon. First, Jesus is going to call his church, the redeemed, those who have been saved, those who are still alive. He's going to call us home. We'll be gone in the twinkling of an eye. And then the world will enter that time of the seven years of tribulation that we've studied over these last months. And then Jesus is coming again. And he is going to put an end to all evil. And he is going to claim his bride, the church, for himself. He's going to set up his reign on this earth for a thousand years. Won't that be a wonderful time? Where the lion lays down with the lamb. And then, and then we will all be home in heaven with him forever. What a day that's going to be. Bill and Gloria Gaither wrote a song. I watched a, a program about Bill and Gloria Gaither this week. Um, by the way, if you don't know who they are, you've sung many of their hymns in church. Songs that they've written. Songs like, Because He Lives. Songs like, The King Is Coming. Whenever you go to a Gaither concert, a lot of times they will sing The King is Coming as their very last song. They celebrate, they sing, and then every time without fail, whenever they begin, people know that tune so much. The King is Coming. When they begin to sing that, people stand to their feet. And there's a joy and there's excitement in looking for the Lord's soon return. Listen to the words that they, that they sing. The marketplace is empty. No more traffic in the streets. All the builders' tools are silent. No more time to harvest wheat. Busy housewives cease their labors. In the courtroom, no debate. Work on earth is all suspended as the king comes through the gate. Oh, the king is coming. The king is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding and now his face I see. Oh, the king is coming. The king is coming. Praise God. He's coming for me. Isn't that good news? And I was watching that documentary and they were talking about that song that they wrote and how, how that has blessed so many Christians. It's a message that we need never to forget. And then they switched gears and they talked about another song that they wrote that churches sing all around the world because he lives. And Gloria shared, she's the one who uh, writes the words to most of their songs. She's very gifted with words. And she said that when she sat down, she and Bill were expecting their firstborn child, whose name was Benji. They were expecting their firstborn child. And all of the things that were going on in the world at that time, around the world, terrible things, just hard to deal with, they had the same concern and anxiety that 
a lot of parents have. Can I bring a child into this world? What will that child have to face? I bet many of you as parents have had those questions. And those of you who are expecting probably have those questions right now. And Gloria sat down. And as she prayed and spent time with the Lord, these words began to come to her heart. And she began to pin them down. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Amen, church? And then Gloria was sharing that. She wrote that song back in night. It became, uh, came on the scene in 1971. That's how long we've been singing that song. And she said she recently had a conversation with her son, Benji. And um, they, have, they have grandchildren now. And he was concerned, the same concerns. And he was voicing them to his mom. Mom, how can I worry? I worry about my children. I think I might be able to live out my days and years on this earth. And, and, and fairly peacefully. But I worry about my child and my grandchildren coming behind me. Things are getting so bad. I worry for them. And Gloria reminded her son. She said, God gave me those words. And they are ever true. No matter how many years pass. No matter how many months. No matter how many weeks. Things have always been bad. Jesus was born into one of the hardest uh, governments and persecution with uh, that a person could be born into. But the truth of God's faithfulness remains for every generation. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living. Just because he lives. Amen. Some of you need to be reminded of that truth this morning. As we go to Revelation, if you've got your Bibles, open them to Revelation 19. And I'm going to pick up where I left off last week, beginning at verse 11. And we're going to read this together. And then we're, we're, we're going to spend a little time in it. And we'll probably come back to it next week. In chapter 19, but verse 11. Listen to God's word. If you can imagine this moment. All the years of injustice and sin and heartache and murder and killings. All the years of a sin-wracked world. Now look at verse 11. And now I saw heaven open. This is John writing, and he has his, his vision is cast to heaven. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written. King of kings. And Lord of lords. I'm not sure I'm going to get past that point today. So I'm going to stop right there. Listen, that, that, that scripture alone ought to make the Baptist want to shout. Jesus is coming. One day. One day in the end of the tribulation. And all these horrible things are going. The Antichrist is ruling and, and, uh, and the people that are worshiping him and all of the persecution of the Christians being martyred and all of that is going on. 
And, there, and then a trumpet's going to sound, and there's going to be a white horse appear. And upon that horse is going to sit the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Can you imagine that moment? I want us to take a look at it, and I want us to look at what the Scripture says. Now, one thing we want to keep in mind today, when Jesus does return, he will do so in power and glory. As he executes justice on all who reject and oppose him. He's going to come to do away with evil once and for all. And King Jesus will return in power and glory. I want us to consider just that thought for a few minutes. King Jesus will, he will come in power and glory. You think about the Lord Jesus. He's the greatest and most influential person who ever lived. Jesus of Nazareth. And as you think about and do a survey of the Bible, it reveals his life. And his life, Jesus' life, can be outlined around seven major events. His incarnation, when the Word became flesh, John 1, 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We're going to celebrate that in just a couple months as we celebrate the birth of Christ. So it's his incarnation and then his baptism when he was immersed by John, when he was anointed by the Holy Spirit and declared by his father to be the Messiah. Remember, as, as, as John baptized the Lord Jesus, a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then the baptism was followed by his temptation. Forty days in the wilderness. And it was during that time that that. God was preparing Jesus to go out and, and do his ministry and complete his mission. And it was in the wilderness that he wrestled and he accepted his destiny as a suffering servant Messiah. And then the fourth thing. So we had his incarnation, his baptism, and then the temptation. And then he lived his life perfect and sinless. And then was his crucifixion on the cross. Where he bore the wrath of God and paid the full penalty of sin. Providing salvation for all who would trust in him. I love that we have a cross hanging. As you enter those doors, the first thing you look and see is the cross. Forever to remind us of the price God paid for our salvation. And the depth of his love for you and for me. It shows us his grace and his mercy. So there was the crucifixion, the incarnation, the baptism, the temptation, the crucifixion, and then his bodily resurrection. Whereby God declared his acceptance of Christ's sacrifice and victory over death, hell, Satan, and sin. Jesus came out of that grave. And then his ascension back to heaven where he intercedes for us at God's right hand and reigns as Lord and King. Do you know that Jesus is interceding for you at God's right hand this morning? I'm going to say that again. If you thought today was just an ordinary day, it's not. Jesus is at the right hand of God praying for you. If no one else prays for you, Jesus prays for you. And I have a feeling his prayers carry some weight. Don't you think? And then after his ascension is his second coming. Where he will establish his universal reign as king of kings and lord of lords. And that's where we are here in chapter 19. The second coming of Christ. It, it will be a historical event. It will be a visible event. It will be his bodily return as the son of God to the earth. Lord willing, I'm looking forward to visiting Israel next year. And one of the places we're going to visit is the Mount of Olives. It gives me goosebumps. You know why? That's where his feet are going to touch down when he comes again. I can't imagine standing there looking around and knowing this. This is. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly.
and the precise purpose of his coming will be to judge Satan, sin, and the system of the world. And it will be to establish his universal, visible manifestation of his kingdom. Listen, Jesus, let's think about Jesus for a minute. You remember when we started the study of Revelation, John had his vision in heaven and he saw a lamb. Remember that? And that lamb was Jesus. He's the perfect, sinless lamb who was sacrificed for our sin. And here, as we come to Revelation 19, he's coming on a white horse as king of kings and lord of lords. That lion has become a lamb. I mean, that lamb has become a lion. And he is coming to rule and to reign. In his first coming, he rode a donkey. In his second coming, he will ride a white horse. In his first coming, he came as a suffering servant. In his second coming, he will come as king and lord. In his first coming, he came in humility and meekness. But in his second coming, he will come in majesty and power. In his first coming, he came to suffer the wrath of God for sinners. In his second coming, he will, establish, he, he will come to establish the kingdom of God for the saints. In his first coming, he was rejected by many as the Messiah. But in his second coming, he will be recognized by all as Lord. In his first coming, he came to seek and to save the lost. In his second coming, he will come to judge and rule as king. In his first coming, he came as God incognito. In his second coming, he will come as God in all his splendor. He comes on that white horse. I want us to peruse through that scripture for just a few minutes. And I'm just wanted, I just want to teach from it. I just want to point out some things. Is that okay with you? Look with me back at Revelation 19 and verses 11 through 16 there. John said, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And the rider on that horse is the Lord Jesus himself. And that white horse symbolizes victory. That white horse symbolizes purity. And the rider, the Lord Jesus, has five names. Four of those names are revealed and one is concealed. Isn't that interesting? The four names that are revealed. Look with me at the scripture in verse 11. Faithful and true. And then in verse 13. His name is called the word of God. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Going down to John 1.14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He is the word. He is the living word. He is the word in the flesh. He is the word that came to reveal God to us in a way that we could understand and see. And he is called the word of God. And then we have the name, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, which is on his thigh. And then back in verse 12, it mentions a name written that no one knew except himself. I was reading in one commentary and it said that name that no one knows except himself is a name that reveals that no one can really know the depth of who he is and the love that he has as, as Lord. We're going to spend all eternity learning more about our Savior. And God. Isn't that incredible? There are not words. There are not English words. There are not Hebrew words. There are not Greek words. That can adequately describe him. Now I'm going to chase a rabbit for just a minute. If you ever thought that our God is boring. If you ever thought that, that, that the Bible is boring. If you ever thought that the, all of this spiritual talk that we do in church is boring. There is nothing boring about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
We're going to spend all eternity having aha moments and falling down at his feet and worshiping him because we learn a new facet about his love and his power and his grace and his wisdom. I can't conceive it. I can't conceive it. I try to think about it. I try to think about when I'm in heaven. The Bible, Jesus told us that he went to prepare a place for us. And if he would go and prepare a place for us, he would come again and receive us unto himself that where he is, there we may be also. So one day I'm going to go to that place he's prepared for me. You're going to go to that place he's prepared for you. I try to imagine that. I know there's going to be moments where we are gathered around the throne of God and we're worshiping and singing with the angels. And, and, and listen, I know that we're going to fall on our face, that he is going to be so holy and so glorious. We're going to fall on our face and we're going to worship with everything within us. And then I try to think about when I'm in my little mansion sometimes. And someone comes by and it's him. And he sits down and has a cup of coffee with me. I know there's coffee in heaven because he grows coffee beans. <laughs> and Jesus is going to sit down and have a cup of coffee with me. And we're going to talk and I'm going to look at him in the eyes. I can't conceive that. And there's going to be so many aha moments and so many of just falling at his feet in worship because we are so overwhelmed with our love and his mercy and his grace and how much he loves us. Can you imagine? Oh, there's not going to be anything boring about heaven. He has gifted you and put talents and gifts in you. And those who are going to be in heaven, it's going to be like he puts a giant magnifying glass on you. And all of those things are going to be accentuated all the more. And you're going to serve. And you're going to love him. You're going to love every day, everything we do. I, I don't know that we'll have days. We're just going to be. We're just going to be. For all eternity. So no one knows what that one name is. It's concealed. Because there aren't words to describe his glory. We learn more. Beginning in verse 12. It adds some further characteristics of our returning king. First his eyes are like a fiery flame. Which communicates his penetrating judgment and insight. As Jesus comes riding on that white horse. He is going to judge the Antichrist. He is going to judge the beast. He is going to judge all those who have followed the Antichrist. He's going to judge all those that have rejected him. And his eyes. Are going to peer into the depths of their souls. How many of you know that Jesus peers into the depths of our souls? He sees every act. He knows every thought. Every emotion. He knows you as no one else knows you. He knows you better than you know yourself. Such a reality, one commentator said, should thrill you and terrify you. It should humble you. He knows you in all of your sin. In all of your depravity and wickedness. And yet he loves you and he cares for you. To know you as he does. And yet still love us. Is simply another evidence of his amazing grace. And here he comes on this horse. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. He is coming as king of kings, as lord of lords, and on his head are many crowns. If anyone uh, deserves to rule and reign, our wonderful Lord does. 
And he had a name that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. How many of you know that salvation only comes through the blood of Christ? His robe is dipped in the blood. The blood is always a reminder of the price he paid for you and for me. Can you imagine this image that John saw? He's coming. He's coming. We're going to close with that for today. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, it's an overwhelming thought to know that you are a God who loves us so deeply that Jesus, the Lamb of God, the perfect sinless Lamb, went to the cross. Isaiah says that he was crushed for our iniquities. He was crushed. His blood flowed. And he gave every ounce of life he had because he loves one like me. Ones like we. He was buried. Three days. Satan had thought that he had defeated him. And on that third day, that dead body took a breath. As Lord, you called him out of the grave. And our Savior lives and reigns. And he's coming again. And Lord, we know that the signs all around us, wars and rumors of wars, sickness and disease, Poverty and hunger. Man's mistreatment of man. Even the earth trembles. Earthquakes and hurricanes and tornadoes. And floods and heat and drought. All are signs, birth pains. They're getting closer together. They're getting more intense. Jesus is coming soon. Lord, we know it. So help us to live today like we know it. Help us to live tomorrow like we know it. You want us to enjoy the life we live on this earth, but this earth is not our home. And as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're here for a purpose and a mission. And that mission is to love people and to tell them that you're coming. To warn them. To love them and share the gospel with them. Father, help us to walk so closely with you day in and day out. Timing your word in prayer. Getting to know you that our hearts are so filled with joy in excitement that we can't contain it. And Lord, we have to tell all that we can. Jesus is coming. Be ready. Jesus is coming. Please be ready. For that one who's here today. Who doesn't have the peace of knowing. That they're saved and forgiven. I pray that today would be the day. They say, Lord. Lord. I want to settle it in my heart. I want to believe in you and trust you as my Savior. In just a moment, Lord, as we begin to sing, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move on their hearts and draw them. Lord, that they would step out and come and say, Pastor, I want to know Christ. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to every heart in this place today. We love you. We are so excited. Come quickly. Lord Jesus. 
In your name we pray. Amen.